Discover a lass so beautiful you won't care that she's half fish. Dare to get hooked into believing a myth. Dive into mermaid tales that really have legs. All this and more to enchant, ensnare, and drown you in bewilderment. It's an oceanic oddity. It's crypto captivating. It's this week's brisk, briny bottle of odd tonic. Welcome to the parlor. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Maxwell. Have a seat, dear guest. This evening, tea time includes a small tray filled with oceanic delights. Mm, Shigoku oysters and pen cove mussels. Mm, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> All in honor of tonight's highly anticipated topic, wherein we explore the briny depths in search of the beguiling, if legendarily baneful enigma... The mermaid. <laughs> she may lead your ship to crash upon the rocks and drag you fathoms deep to your death, but boy, can she sing. <laughs> and according to a popular coffee chain, she can make a mean quad pump triple shot hazelnut macchiato. <laughs> Mermaids are a topic I've really wanted to cover since we started the podcast. I know, which mm -hmm. probably comes as no surprise to some of our listeners as they know that mermaids hold a special place in your heart. They really do. So how many years have you now spent in Mermania? I think I've been making mermaid tales and swimming as one for seven years. Seven yeah. years? Yeah, it's wow. been seven years. It's probably <laughs> one of the lengthiest hobbies I've ever had. Yeah, and if you're curious, dear guest, and you should be, <laughs> you can glimpse our Jennifer going full mermaid at her <laughs> website, mermaidmystic.com. That's mystic spelled M-Y-S-T-I-C. We should post some of my mermaid images in our odd tonic group and disclose that you're my amazing photographer for mm. the photos. Mm. Well, no one can ever accuse us of not being oddly diverse. Never. <laughs> okay. Well, my love, will you do us the honor of smashing the champagne bottle over the bow and hoisting anchor on tonight's aquatic adventure? C'est déjà fait, mon capitaine. We assume that everyone's already pretty familiar with the idea of mermaids, the beautiful creature whose top is all woman and whose bottom half is pure mackerel. <laughs> Culturally, mermaids are set neatly on the shelf with other legends and folklore, right next to unicorns, the tooth fairy, and a flattering bridesmaid's dress. <laughs> but if you flip back through the pages of history, you'll discover that there have been serious reported sightings of mermaids and humanoid sea creatures throughout classic and modern eras. And, as unlikely as it sounds, when you start to plumb the depths of these detailed accounts and descriptions, you start to question whether or not mermaids are just a fishtail. Tonight, we're going to explore the myth, history, and sightings of merfolk. Plus, we'll investigate why mermaids have such a grisly reputation, sharing tales of those who unknowingly waded into their dark waters. But first, let's explore the lighter side of mermaid myth and a few historical sightings from the past. Let's dive in. In recent years, mermaids have dramatically resurfaced in popular culture in ways, like mermaids themselves, that remain unexplained and irresistible. Through modern eyes, the mermaid is the embodiment of feminine mystery, creativity, independence, fearlessness, and magic. But these attributes, it seems, are nothing new. Humans have long been enchanted by this mysterious creature. There are hundreds of mermaid legends spanning continents and dating back thousands of years. The first mermaid story began with Adar Goddess, the goddess of love and fertility, worshipped in ancient Syria around 1000 BCE. According to one telling of her myth, Adar Goddess fell in love with a young shepherd named Hadad. He being a mere mortal, died during their sweet, sweet goddess lovemaking. Worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Grief-stricken, Adar Goddess threw herself into a nearby lake to drown herself, which, culturally, was understood to transform you into a fish after death. But her goddess beauty was such that she could not die, nor 
fully become a fish, and the waters transformed her into what we now recognize as a mermaid. Adder goddess was later adopted into ancient Greek worship and mythology, first as a Syrian goddess, and later becoming a composite with Aphrodite. Greek mythology also greatly expanded upon the concept of sea maidens and introduced us to the Nereids, Tritons, and Sirens. For ancient Romans, like the Greeks, the realm of gods and mortals were quite blurred in everyday life, as illustrated in Pliny the Elder's book, Natural History, written in the first century CE. Alongside accurate descriptions of elephants and hippos, Pliny writes about the Nereids, sea maidens with rough, scaly bodies like a fish, who can be seen, quote, riding upon dolphins or hippocamps. Pliny also describes how a high-ranking military officer of Gaul wrote to the late Emperor Augustus about, quote, a considerable number of Nereids being found dead upon the seashore. Pliny also states, I have, too, some distinguished informants of equestrian rank who state that they themselves once saw in the ocean of Gadiz a sea man. And so it went for centuries. Tales of merfolk presented quite seriously in other books of knowledge, ships' logbooks, and historical accounts. Their numbers are so vast that we couldn't hope to cover them all, dear guest. Instead, we'll share the stories that Jennifer and I find to be the most entertaining and fascinating. And we found plenty that do more than just tell of a tail splash some 50 feet off the bow with harsh sunlight in a drunken sailor's eyes. In 1403, a terrible tempest lashed the Dutch coast. Violent waves destroyed the dike, separating Permer Lake from the Zuldersee. Water came gushing in, and with it came an unintentional visitor. After the storm subsided and the dike was repaired, life returned to normal. As two Edom milkmaids traveled to get their herds, they spied an odd woman, naked and covered in algae and kelp, peeking at them from the surface of the lake. At first they were quite frightened of her, so seemed the strange woman of them. But as time went on, they became accustomed to their new aquatic neighbor and even ventured to row out to her for a closer look. Seeing that this wild mare woman intended no harm, the ladies decided she would make the best pet ever and pulled her into their boat and brought her back to Edom. Kindly, they cleaned the goo and plants off of her and dressed her in clothes. They named her Minnie. Unlike the popular brand, this mermaid had two legs, but she was no less a mysterious creature. It became obvious that Minnie could not speak, the native tongue anyway, and that she wanted very much to return to the water. But the citizens of Edom could not bear to relinquish their new friend and guarded her escape, raising her as a human. Well, of course, the sensational news made the rounds, and eventually the powerful city of Harlem made it known that they wanted her to live in their city. So Edom presented Minnie to Harlem as a gift. Soon, the merwoman was taken to a new home on the main street of Harlem, where she was assigned a teacher. Although she never learned to speak, she was taught to use a spinning wheel and to show devotion at prayer. It is said she lived this way for 15 years, and when she died, she was buried as a Christian in a local cemetery. Now, this is likely all balderdash. The folly of a mute girl discovered by a <laughs> bored and overly excitable town in desperate need of a bowling alley, right? <laughs> then let's jump to stories that have been reported within the last hundred years or so, an era less influenced by myth and superstition. This intriguing story survives as a British press clipping from 1810. It reads as follows. Two mer children were lately discovered by three respectable tradesmen of Douglas, Isle of Man, during an excursion on the Calf of Man in quest of sea fowl. Attracted by a sound somewhat resembling the cries of a young kitten, they found, searching among the rocks, two small marine animals, exactly resembling in their form that species of creature so often described and known by the name of merman. One of them was dead, 
and much lacerated by the violence with which it had been driven on shore during a violent gale on the preceding night. The other was, however, conveyed to Douglas, where it still remains, and seems likely to do well. It is one foot eleven inches and three quarters in length, from the crown of its head to the extremity of its tail, five inches across the shoulders. Its skin is of a very pale brown color, and the scales on its tail are tinged with violet. The hair, if it may be so called, on its head is of a light green cast. It is attached to the crown of the head, only hanging loose about the face about four inches in length, very gelatinous to the touch, and somewhat resembling the green seaweed commonly growing on rocks. Its mouth is small and has no appearance of teeth. It delights much in swimming about in a large tub of sea water and feeds chiefly on mussels and other shellfish, which it devours with avidity. It also now and then swallows small portions of milk and water when given to it in a quill. Oh. No word is given on the fate of either man or merchild. Such a great story. It really is. I feel like you're reading me a newspaper article in the 1800s. <laughs> By God, I am. <laughs> but in that time period, you know what I mean. <laughs> One of the things I love about these clippings from the 1800s is that everyone was very scientifically minded mm. by that point. And you can really see it in this story alone, you know, the measurements mm -hmm. of, of the merchild and the very detailed description. Mm -hmm. um, that is rather compelling. Right. And I just love how the description of this small exotic creature and how they describe it as mewing like a kitten. Mm -hmm. Just you really get this sense of emotion coming through with the the way this this creature reacts to swimming and eating and, and things like that. It's just it just feels very realistic. Right, right. And that's the thing that really makes you stop and pause and makes you wonder, was it just an elaborate prank or was there something to some of these encounters yeah i really wish we could go back and find out absolutely well, it's no surprise this story came from the Isle of Man. The UK is a global hotspot for mermaid sightings. Here's one from Galway in the west of Ireland. Saunders newspaper from 1819 gives this stylized account. Naturalists have hitherto doubted the existence of mermaids and mermen. We have it now in our power to set at rest the doubts of skeptics upon this duplex order of animals, one having been lately discovered, basking upon the rocks in Derry Gilma in Erisburg after the ebbing of the tide. It was discovered by a female of the lower order. She was suddenly startled by a kind of scream, which was followed by the plunging of an animal, half female and half fish, her lower extremities having the confirmation of a dolphin. The tide being out, the animal had some difficulty in reaching the water. Thomas Evans Esquire of Cleggan, a gentleman well known to many of our readers, just arrived upon the coast in time to witness her last plunges. Having gained the water, she disappeared for a few moments, but again appeared perfectly composed. Mr. Evans now had a favorable opportunity of examining this long-doubted genus. It was about the size of a well-grown child of ten years of age, a bosom, prominent of a girl of sixteen, a profusion of long, dark brown hair, full dark eyes, hands and arms formed like the human species, with a slight web connecting the upper parts of the fingers, which were frequently employed throwing back her flowing locks and running them through her hair. Her movements in the water seemed principally directed by the finny extremity. For near an hour she remained in apparent tranquility in the view of upwards of three hundred persons, until a musket was leveled at her, which, having flashed in the pan, she immediately dived and was not afterwards seen. This is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> I love how she's swimming around for nearly an hour in apparent tranquility, and then they decide to shoot her. Yeah, well, we can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> she looks too calm. Get her. <laughs> and 300 witnesses. That may have been a bit of hyperbole. But this story was famous in its time. It needed literally no introduction when people wrote about it, which made for some really interesting research mm. in trying to get the tales about it. 
now let's skip from Ireland over to Wales for this 1826 encounter, reported in Aberystwyth. On an early sunny July morning, a farmer, whose house was within 300 feet of the seashore, descended the rock and saw a woman washing herself in the sea within a stone's throw from him. Ooh. At first, he modestly turned back, but after a moment's reflection, he thought that the woman would not go so far out into the sea as it was high tide, and he was certain that the water was six feet deep in the spot where she was standing, and the water was merely at her waist. After considering the matter, he ducked down and crept to the edge of the precipice from which he had a good view of her. Her hair was short and of a dark color. Her neck and arms were like those of any other ordinary woman, her breast blameless and her skin whiter than that of any person he had ever seen before. The farmer confided that he had never witnessed, but very few women, so handsome in appearance as this mermaid. After more than a half an hour of scrutiny, he crept back to call his family to see what was clear to him, an honest-to-goodness mermaid. He directed them to go and creep near the rock as he had done. It still being early, some of them went when they were only half-dressed, having just risen up from bed. After arriving at the spot, they watched her for about ten minutes as the farmer was calling his wife and the younger child. The whole family declared that the mermaid was exactly the same as a young woman of about eighteen years of age, both in shape and stature. Her face was towards the shore. She bent herself down frequently, as if taking up water, and then holding her hand before her face for about half a minute. When she was thus bending herself, there was to be seen some black thing, as if there was a tail turning up behind her. She often made a noise like sneezing, which caused the rock to echo. When the wife finally joined them, she did not lower herself as the others had done, but walked on within sight of the creature. <laughs> there could only be one handsome lady on this farm, sea wet. <laughs> <laughs> As soon as the mermaid saw her, she dived into the water and swam away till she was about the same distance from them as she was when she was first seen. The whole family, husband, wife, children, men servants, and maid servants, all together twelve in number, ran along the shore for more than half a mile, and during most of that time they saw her in the sea, and sometimes her head and shoulders were upwards out of the water. The spectacle was talked about for years after the occurrence. I'll bet. <laughs> yeah, blameless breasts. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I love in these stories how they always have to do a quick check you know, on, the, uh, on the hooter action. <laughs> There's always some kind of ranking system. <laughs> right, right. You know, I love the details of the mermaid mm. uh, of this story, the short hair mm -hmm. and the uh, bending down. And cupping the water. Cupping the water and like mm -hmm. holding it in front of her face for half a minute. I find it really an intriguing visual that her she has a black tail. Yeah. It's not something that you see or, or consider very often, but I just love the imagery of it. And the image of 12 half-dressed people running excitedly after her down the coast <laughs> is wonderful, too. <laughs> I could just like see people in their dressing gowns or like, you know, holding their pants up without a belt. <laughs> Have like, buttoned shirts and one sleeve out. <laughs> there she is. I see her. <laughs> Keep running, chaps. <laughs> Love it. Back to the UK. In the notes of his 1900 book, Carmina Gadelica, Hymns and Incantations, Volume 2. You know, I loved Volume 1. <laughs> Alexander Carmichael included these three stories from Scotland. Colin Campbell, a farmer on the Isle of Barra, thought he saw an otter on a reef. The otter was holding and eating a fish. Campbell raised his gun to fire, as you do, when to his surprise the creature before him now resembled a woman holding a child. That must have been one big otter. <laughs> <laughs> he had a telescope that had been given to him by a sea captain for brave service rendered at sea, and looking through the glass, he saw that the object before him had the head, the hair, neck, shoulders, and breast of a woman, and was holding a child. The man was greatly astonished, and concluded that this must be the mermaid of whom he had often heard. Inwardly, he thanked the loving virgin for having withheld his hand. Mm. Campbell put away his spyglass. The click of the glass startled the mermaid, and in a twinkling of the eye, she and her child went into the sea with a splash. Colin Campbell, an honest, intelligent, middle-aged man, 
firmly believed that he had seen a mermaid. I love it. The next tale involves Neil McKetchen, a farmer from South Uist who was with others aboard a skiff, becalmed in the sound of Mull. The sun was scorching, the air was breathless, and the surface of the sea was smooth as polished glass, when all were astonished to see a creature about two yards from the side of the motionless skiff. Its head, neck, breast, and shoulders resembled those of a woman, though its hair was more coarse and its eyes more glassy. All below the breast was in water. (laughs) The breast is a traditional marker of water. (laughs) (laughs) The creature gazed at them for a minute or more with its large, wandering eyes, and then disappeared into the sea as silently as it had come. Neil offered no explanation of the strange phenomenon, never having seen anything like it before through all his life accustomed to the sea. One of his companions, however, said that it was the mermaid, and declared that he had seen a creature exactly like it some years previously while cutting kelp in South Uist. Neil McKetchen was an entirely truthful man and incapable of inventing. He was one of nature's nobles, being richly endowed mentally and physically, and with a phenomenal memory. Ah, oh, that Neil. <laughs> I think Alexander Carmichael had a massive crush on this guy. I think you're right. <laughs> And finally, our last story from Scotland. In 1830, people were cutting seaweed in Grimness Bembecula. Before putting on her stockings, one of the women went down to the lower end of the reef to wash her feet. While doing so, she heard a splash in the calm sea, and looking up, she saw a creature in the form of a woman in miniature a few feet away. Alarmed, the woman called to her friends, and all the people present rushed to the place. The creature made somersaults and turned about in various directions. Some men waded into the water to seize her, but she moved beyond their reach. A few boys threw stones at her, one of which struck her in the back. (sighs) A few days later, the strange creature was found dead on the shores nearly two miles away. Mm. The upper portion of the creature was about the size of a well-fed child of three or four years of age, with abnormally developed breasts for one so small. There it is again. (laughs) The hair was long, dark, and glossy, while the skin was white, soft, and tender. The lower part of the body was like a salmon, but without scales. Crowds of people, some from long distances, came to see this strange animal, and all were unanimous in the opinion that what they had gazed upon was a mermaid. Mr. Duncan Shaw, sheriff of the district, ordered a coffin and shroud to be made for the mermaid. This was done, and the body was buried in the presence of many people, a short distance above the shore where it had been found. The exact marking of the grave is lost in time. Wow. This story is so sad. They threw rocks at a mermaid and killed it. Hmm. Why does rock throwing have to be such a persistent activity in history? (laughs) Because there were no bowling alleys. We covered this, love. (laughs) Bowling was invented to redirect the hurtling of heavy objects at wooden pins instead of people and mermaids. (laughs) After hearing all these stories, I'm wondering if merfolk used to be rather commonplace until we stoned them, shot them, or captured them and made them spin yarn. (laughs) Well, we've certainly given them good reason to hide from us (laughs) if that's what's going on. But don't you hide from us, dear guest. When we return, we'll disclose how your mermaid fandom can make you a millionaire. And we'll venture into darker waters to investigate another terrifying monster from Zimbabwe. Oh no, a mere goblin. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) You'll have to stick around to find out. You're listening to Odd Tonic. Lash yourself to the ship's mast if you have to. We'll be back with more sirens and sea nymphs after this quick, refreshing dip. Thanks for spending time with us this evening, dear guest. We hope we've hooked you and reeled you in with our... Seductive siren song. Ooh. 
<laughs> I was going to say rotten fish puns, but I like your idea much better. <laughs> Me too. Whatever the reason you find yourself in our waters, if you'd like to support the show, let the currents take you to our Patreon at patreon.com slash odd tonic. We have uniquely craft oddities and rewards waiting for you. It's a pirate's plunder of t-shirts, keepsakes, and more. And the rewards for last month's new Patreon supporters are shipping out to sea as we speak. From the briny depths of our hearts, we can't thank our supporters enough. Mm. And in honor of our mermaid episode, we are offering a new Patreon supporter reward. A special signed mermaid mini print of our lovely Jennifer. While supplies last. Yay! Swim on over to patreon.com slash odd tonic to check it out. And truly an ocean of thanks for supporting the podcast. Now, let's return for more puzzling pearls from the past. Welcome back. So far, we've learned that your wife really hates your mermaid ogling hobby. <laughs> and if you really want to incite murder, just bring a mermaid to the party. <laughs> But in our mermaid episode's bottom half, <laughs> we've saved our favorite tale for the very end. So don't drift away. Mm. Instead, let's discover how to make beach combing really pay off for you. Metal detector not required. All of our mermaid stories up until now have been in the distant past, which, as we know, makes them more difficult to have relevance in the human <laughs> mind. So how about a recent mermaid sighting from within the last 10 years? Not only has that happened, but there could be a treasure chest size reward in it for you. Let's sail to Israel to find out more. Since 2009, locals and tourists in the Israeli town of Kirat Yam have been roaming the coastline in hopes of glimpsing a mermaid who is said to only appear at sunset. She performs a few tricks for onlookers and then slips beneath the waves to disappear for the night. One of the first people to see the mermaid, Shlomo Cohen, said, I was with friends when suddenly we saw a woman lying in the sand in a weird way. At first... I thought she was just another sunbather, but when we approached, she jumped into the water and disappeared. We were all in shock because we saw she had a tail. Council spokesperson Natty Zilberman says, Many people are telling us they are sure they've seen a mermaid, and they are all independent of each other. People say it is half girl, half fish, jumping like a dolphin, does all kinds of tricks, then disappears. Wow. As someone who swims as a mermaid... I can tell you jumping out of the water like a dolphin is pretty impossible to do, I mean, as a human. Yeah, I was thinking that too. I've seen one professional swimmer start like 50 feet down to get enough momentum to break out of the water and catch any air. Wow, interesting. Mm -hmm. The town's tourism board is, of course, delighted with their newfound fame and mysterious tourist attraction. Taking a cue from the town of Inverness, Scotland, on the shore of Loch Ness, the Kirat Yam government has offered a $1 million reward for the first person to photograph the creature. Wow. Zilberman thinks the reward money is well spent. I believe if there is really a mermaid, then so many people will come to Kirat Yam, a lot more money will be made than $1 million. Mm. At least one film crew spent an entire week filming on location above and below the water. The crew claimed that during one of the late-night outings, they managed to spot a human figure dipping into the water and then disappearing underwater. So the town's reward money remains unclaimed while the economy benefits from the influx of tourists vying to get a rewarding photo. With the current popularity of mermaids and the availability of some very lifelike-looking tales, I can imagine them wanting to change their criteria of proof to being a bit more than just a photo. Mm -hmm. I mean, my love, even you and I could easily go and snap some photos and claim that million dollars. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, while we mull that over, where are we headed to next, my jolly sailor bold? Well, I've set our course for Zimbabwe, but hold fast, my love. Grim and fairly horrifying waters lie ahead. What is going on in Zimbabwe? I don't know. In 2017 in Zimbabwe, the mysterious drowning death of two young boys is being blamed on a mermaid attack. Oh no. Mm -mm. 
Quote, according to a friend of the deceased boys, his companions jumped into the dam and tried to grab the mermaid because they believed it was just a big fish, said Chief Namongwe. But the mermaid pulled them down into the water. The friend then ran home to alert the elders who arrived at the dam to find the boys lying on a rock, miraculously still alive. Quote, when their parents got to the dam, they panicked, believing their children had died and started crying. A whirlwind suddenly engulfed the place before the mermaid swiftly appeared from the water and grabbed the boys for a second time, but this time their lifeless bodies resurfaced later, said Chief Namongwe. Wow. A whirlwind? Yeah, imagine like a whirlpool had kind of opened up. The creature's decision to kill the children is suspected of being caused by the tears of their parents, since local legend states that it is unwise to cry in front of a mermaid, lest one wishes to die. So many rules. Yeah. How do people keep track of these? I don't know. Quote, two other people that I am aware of were also killed at the same dam in similar circumstances. As a community, we have since performed some rituals to calm down the water spirits. During the ceremony, we slaughtered a beast and the meat was consumed without salt, said Chief Nabongwe. Water Resources Minister Sam Nakomo had told Parliament that operations to commission pumps at the dam were halted after frightened workers found the machines had, quote, broken down under unclear circumstances without any traces of vandalism. Weird. Divers had been sent down to investigate the cause of the blockages in the pumps, but returned to the water's surface, vowing to never go back down, Mm -hmm. the South African Press Association reported. Wow. They claimed they had been terrorized by mermaids lurking there, which were said to look like pale-skinned humans with black hair and fish tails, which matches the African lore of the Mandau, which describes a woman with a fish-like tail swimming in fresh and salt water off the coast. They, too, are said to have shiny, long black hair, extremely pale white skin, and red eyes. Wow. I don't know about the red eyes, but certainly the extremely pale skin and long black hair are definitely reoccurring features that we've seen time and time again Mm -hmm. in these stories. Definitely. Quote, this is when we hired white consultants, thinking our people were vulnerable because they were Africans. But the whites, too, vowed never to go back there, Nakomo told the Senate committee. The problem was reportedly solved when the water ministry hired traditional healers to conduct rituals. The traditional leaders held a ceremony in which they slaughtered cattle and brewed beer to appease the water spirits. Mm. Quote, I do not believe in mermaids, but the community that lives in the area does, Nakomo said. Wow. Once again, Zimbabwe, you mm. have blown our minds. Yeah. The Mandao sound absolutely terrifying. Mm. I talked briefly online with a woman who lives in Zimbabwe. She was curious about the mermaid stories there and said that whenever she asked the locals about it, they just refused to talk about it, mm. as if doing so could actually get you cursed. Wow, really? Mm-hmm. Well, they would know. <laughs> <laughs> Respect. Yeah. Well, what can we do to... Uh, Disperse the heaviness brought on by the evil Mandao. It's time for the final tale we've been waiting to share with our dear guests. Oh, perfect timing. Mm, It's one of wonder and beauty that only a mermaid could grant you. In Canada, in the early 70s, Vancouver Sun columnist Jack Scott shared this story that involved his very close friend named Bill Evans, who had recently died. In the vicinity of Vancouver, there had been a New Year's Eve party at a house on the shore. There had been a beach bonfire, but at this point, people had retreated inside. Evans and Scott had remained. Scott attended to the bonfire while Evans had wandered down to the beach. His excuse was picking oysters, but it was a walk of solitude common to him. The blaze was quite robust just then, and it and the moonlight illuminated a large section of the beach. Evans had been gone oyster-picking for about twenty minutes when Scott looked up and noticed his friend standing, transfixed. Ultimately noticing Scott staring, Evans slowly waved him to come over. When Scott arrived, his friend seemed quietly introspective. Neither talked. They walked a bit further down the beach and sat. Evans, still staring out into the ocean bay, then said, "'I've just met a mermaid.' Scott, of course, thought this was a joke, but Evans, sensing that, waved away further comment. Bill said, 
She came into the shallow water at the point, and then she came out of the water on the beach, where we get the clams. She was very beautiful. She had long golden hair. Well, it was more like ribbons of kelp, but somehow beautiful. She had a long green fish-like tail that was part of her exquisite body. I didn't know what to say to her. Scott, stunned by these comments by a close friend who had never had any tendency to engage in foolishness of anything like this sort, noted the euphoric appearance on his face and had to take him seriously. He asked him, Well, what did you say? Evans gave a bemused, self-deprecating smile and said, Aren't you cold? She gave a laugh in a non-human but still human low voice like, quote, an offshore breeze, and said that, no, she wasn't. She asked him why the people had been gathering on the beach, and he talked a bit about New Year's and parties with friends. Evans thought that they talked for about five minutes. Scott asked if he could describe her. Evans was a bit embarrassed. The mermaid was topless, and he felt that her great beauty and the extraordinary interaction that they were having made his looking at her something that he didn't want to make so obvious that she thought him a crude lout. (laughs) But he responded to Scott's question this way. There was nothing even remotely self-conscious about her, you understand. But since she wore no clothes, I felt a little embarrassed about looking at her. Still, I saw enough to know that she was absolutely lovely. You could say, breathtakingly beautiful. When I asked her at one point where she lived, she pointed out to the water and the path of the moon. Then we saw someone coming down the beach, and she took my hand for a second and slipped into the bay and was gone. Evans unconsciously lifted his hand towards the water. They sat a while in silence. When Evans died, He asked for his ashes to be scattered in that very bay, despite the fact that he had never been a sailor, nor ever owned the smallest boat. (laughs) I love that story so much. Such a heartwarming and heartbreaking story. It really captures the mystery and the poetry of mermaids. The fact that he requested his ashes to be placed in the bay says a lot about Bill Evans' experience. Mm, Yes, and whatever he experienced must have just moved him to the core. Mm -hmm. How often does that happen in life? Well, dear guest, we encourage you to venture out to a secluded midnight beach and find your mermaid. Oh, that's so endearing, my love. Well, it's important. And I know that I've found mine. (sighs) Let's wrap up this episode so I can drown you in kisses. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> okay, then. Well, that wraps up this Supernatural Sea Foam edition of Odd Tonic. Remember to subscribe so you never miss a show. And leave us a kind review on iTunes so other weirdos know what they're in for. Find our community on Facebook so you can keep the odd vibes humming all week long. It's at facebook.com slash groups slash Odd Tonic Society. And let us know what you think of tonight's episode. Do you have a mermaid story of your own to share? You have a captive audience, so join us online. We'll be back next week with more weird history, strange science, and paranormal ponderings. This is, dear guest, goodbye for now. But remember, if you ever find yourself adrift on a lonely sea at night, with only the moon and the lapping of the waves to keep you company, when a hand reaches from the water to grab the edge of your boat, First one, and then another. Don't worry. It's just us. Good night.